Welcome in to another Everything's Coming Up Timberwolves podcast. My name is Gabe Anderson, and I'm joined, as always, by Chris Emerson. Chris, how are we doing? Doing great. Doing awesome. great. My son just turned 10, so uh, I had a birthday, and it was a good time, so we're all good. Awesome. Glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. And we are also joined by Jared Good. Jared, how are we doing? I'm doing good. Um, happy, happy to be back here. It took a couple of days. Uh, a little bit longer than it normally does, but uh, we always make it happen and, and get her done for the for the show. Absolutely, absolutely. And what a uh, a week it's been for Minnesota Timberwolves basketball. Uh, we fell last night to the New Orleans Pelicans, but before that, four wins in a row for the first time in I don't know how long. But it's it's been a pretty long time since we've had, let alone two wins in a row. I mean, we we put together four. Uh, so let, let's talk about it um, first, but first let's start with uh, last night's game. Of course, the Timberwolves lose to the Pelicans in overtime. Uh, let's start with you, Chris. What did you see out of the Wolves in last night's game? Um, Just, you know, like at this point, I'm just looking for development of players and just kind of like see if they're making their next step. Um, in the game in total, I saw – just the difference between i mean it's easy to say but i how we get how we get officiated um we got officiated i thought horribly like i saw i mean zion is getting that like jordan call back when jordan was hot where if he misses a layup all of a sudden there's a whistle like every missed layup he gets a whistle um so that was weak cat was getting hit Nas was getting hit no calls so but again, like I've talked about multiple times, once we start winning and once we start being like a playoff level team, maybe we'll start getting calls. Mm -hmm. um, so that was frustrating. But watching Jaden McDaniels over this week just turn into a different type of player slowly, like taking the ball to the hole. Like I saw him draw a block on somebody. Like if Jaden takes it so hard where a guy fills the gap and he still goes up for the – I mean, that's – that's not the Jaden McDaniels we saw weeks ago or months ago. So I like to see that. Um, I like to see uh, – I feel like Edwards is fitting in good with the, – the, my biggest concern before last week was how is he going to fit in with Cat and Russell? Is Russell going to get him the ball enough? Um, I think he's fitting in nice that way. Uh, but in that game specific, specifically, I mean, we had our hands on a lot of balls. I think we stole – 17 or something like that um d was hard played well just just lost the game you know mm -hmm. almost a perfect outcome played solid and lost that's what we need right now absolutely and from what i saw i actually i ended up missing the game last night but just looking at the box score it looked like it looked like everyone contributed for the timberwolves it looked pretty balanced uh carl anthony towns 28 anthony edwards 29 d -low with 17, Nas Reed 17, Wancho, who we got to talk about him too in a little bit. But Wancho oh, yeah. continues his solid play, you know, 14 points in 21 minutes. Um, Jane McDaniels on defense. So uh, let, let's go to you, Jared. Uh, what 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 did you see out of the Wolves last night? Uh, you know, I've seen this team, when I, when I look at this team, I look at them and I say, man, they're so good offensively. d -low looks like he's a top five point guard in the entire league uh he's playing with unreal confidence he can pass the ball he's shooting and he's still coming off the bench um for whatever reason other than the fact that you know we don't really need to start him so who cares um but man he looks really really good lately and then um and then and then you see the pelicans you know it's nothing new with the timberwolves you know we just give out career highs to people uh alonzo ball exactly high he had eight threes you know, he had a near triple-double. I mean, that's just what we do, and, and we talked about it a little bit. Um, just, you know, I mean, in yesterday's game in particular, it was just another Wolves game. We score a ton, and so do they, and they were just a little bit better than us um, when it came to scoring. But that's what the Wolves do, man. They, they, they put the ball in the hoop, but they're, <laughs> they're going to let the guy on the other end fill it up too. So, uh, mm -hmm. but nothing new there. Um, still looking to get a little bit better – defensively and in the four wins that we had um i thought that we we were starting to get a little bit better defensively uh which is good 
But also, um, speaking of the four wins, I looked around the league just as kind of a um, just just as kind of an example. I'm like, man, Timberwolves might be the hottest team in the league right now. And we were tied. We were tied with, uh, I believe, Denver, and I think it might have been Boston. But two other teams had a win streak of four at the time, so we were the hottest team in the entire NBA. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we Did were. See, and, oh, go go ahead, Chris. Did you see last game? D'Lo did go one for twelve from three. Like that's one of those things that just doesn't happen. And you know, one or two. I mean, any game of basketball is one or two plays. But man, dude, one of twelve. Like that's. I will put uh, a handsome sum of money that he won't shoot one of twelve. You know, again this year. Right, and you know, I mean. I just like even though he didn't shoot the ball well, I still thought he looked really, really good. Like just and you know he has it. He's a and, star. Uh, and uh, you know, like Nas. I mean, I mean, I just I, Nas and Edwards and like all these guys just look. They look good, you know. Um, mm-hmm. And that's just that's who we're gonna be. You know, next year we're gonna be a good team, and and we keep talking it into, you know. It, there's no other team in the entire NBA that's 17 and 24 that has as high expectations as the Timberwolves next year. And um, it's a real life thing and we're going to be good. And we've been saying it for 20 years, but I believe it more next year than I ever had before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and t- and we could talk about the, uh, the four game win streak, obviously, but last night, I mean, you, you mentioned uh, D'Angelo Russell only shoots one of 12 from three. But still, I mean, I see him out there, and I see him contributing uh, with passing the ball. Like, he had 11 assists last night. He He's dropping dimes, and he absolutely is more than just a pure scorer. I mean, he is a pure scorer, but he absolutely is more than that. And like I said, Juancho Hernan Gomez, I almost think next year, if he's around next year, I almost think he's one of the keys to our team. If he could come off the bench – and play like he has been recently. I mean, he had 14 uh, last night. He had 22 against the Rockets. He had, let's see, how many did he have against the Warriors? Nine against the Warriors, but not too shabby. Uh, Chris, you had some? I mean, and it's not even the the box score production. He just looks good. Like, when he comes off, he's been hitting that that straight on, straight on three. He comes off a screen and gets that ball, and he fires it with no hesitation. And, I mean, he's been back of the rim just pounding them in every time. I mean, he's looked confident. His stroke looks good. Um, And and it's something that I said in the beginning of this podcast, like maybe 10 podcasts ago, when everyone was killing um, Wancho. I'm like, this guy is a career, like, 38% three-point shooter, like, that's what he shot in Europe. That's what he shot in Denver. That's what he shot every single year that I could find stats for in his professional career is, you know, 38, 39, 40% three-point shooter. Like, that's who he is. So when he was shooting 20%, it's like that's – I mean, that's not going to that's not gonna happen. Like, it's, it's going to get back to, you know – 35, 36, 37. It just depends on if he can do enough other stuff uh, to make it count. And, you know, he's hustling enough. He's getting his hands on loose balls, man. He's a, I mean, for his contract, which is like one year guaranteed at six or something like that or seven left, like, I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. And, like, that's a takeaway from Wancho because he has been playing really good, but so is Jared Vanderbilt. Like Vanderbilt yeah. off the bench has just been an energizer bunny, and he's just found him spots, self in the right spot. Like this team is just finally clicking now, um, and it kind of sucks to see it happen when we're at the tail end of a of a season that that doesn't really mean a whole lot. But like these couple weeks are going to mean more this season going into next season. Like. You know, nobody cares what the, no one cares what the Magic and the Pistons are going to do for the next two two weeks because they're going to suck, you know. We're not going to suck next year. So these are actually kind of important weeks. Um, as much as we would like to uh, to maintain our draft pick, it's still percentage points, fractions of percentage points. It really doesn't matter. Either way, we're going to have to hit a ping pong ball or we're not, and that's not something you can really control. 
Like losing these games won't do a whole lot for us percentage points wise um, for the ping pong balls. So Mm -hmm. I would rather, I would rather just see the team look good like they have and and gel well, like they, they absolutely have. And and just keep keep building what we've been building the last couple of weeks. This team looks good it, uh, offensively. They look f- unbelievable, um, and and we've talked about defense a few times before. But like even even last night, like take away take away D'Lo's one for twelve three point percentage. Uh, I believe he was what seven for ten for the rest of the game elsewhere. Like he was still good outside. Of, he just couldn't hit a three. Mm-hmm. By no means was I trying to say you know dog D'Lo for that but it, it was more like the this is an aberration that right won't happen and same as like Wancho like he's a career x three-point shooter like one for 12 is going to happen but that means he's going to go seven for eight some other game you know like that's how percentages work and, um, and he basically had a very similar type game but the complete opposite a couple weeks ago so it, exactly it, it makes sense you know Exactly. But yeah, man, we're coming together at the right time. And you know, if we can finish strong at the end of the year, that that stays in these young kids minds a lot longer than if we had a, you know, eight game hot streak in the middle of the season. And I think it means more because we added a new coach, like it's adding confidence to these guys. When you add a new coach, there's kind of a lot of uncertainty. We're young and we haven't figured it out and we're starting to now. And I think that whether I think that could go a long way looking at the beginning of next season. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, like we said, Timberwolves went on a four game winning streak and not, not, uh, not, not only did they win, they beat some pretty good teams. In fact, the best team record wise in the NBA twice. Uh, uh, Of course they didn't have Donovan Mitchell, but they beat the jazz twice. Then they beat the Rockets, which I mean, I mean, yes, Kevin Porter Jr. had 50 points earlier this week, but they still lost. And then they beat the Golden State Warriors. So, I mean, a pretty good stretch there. The Warriors just kind of cling, holding to the last spot in the play-in tournament. Uh, Chris, you got some? Yeah, I mean, it's cool to get excited about these games, but let's be honest. Um, as we saw when you take an all-star off our roster, especially the guy who stirs a drink, your team is much, much worse. Um, the Jazz, like we were better than all those teams we played. Like the Timberwolves are a better team than the Jazz without Donovan Mitchell, I think. You know, we're a better team than the Rockets, obviously. And I think we're a better team than Golden State. Like we're a better team than them. We should win. Like those are games we should win. We were we're a better team, I think, than the Pelicans. We should have beat the Pelicans. Um we have to look at this team not as their record but as what they are now that people are healthy, you know, and if Beasley was back, it'd be even different. But I mean, we're like, we've said from the beginning, we're a 500 team Mm -hmm. and Golden State. I don't know if they are 500, but they're barely if they are. And I don't know if the jazz without Donovan Mitchell would be 500. Maybe, Um, maybe that someone else would step up, but I mean, that's a guy that, you know, in the bubble last year, looked like an MVP. I mean, I think he was a bubble MVP, but I mean, it, I mean, these are, that's a high level guy to, 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 you know, we see what the Lakers are doing without LeBron, like um, losing that type of talent is hard to make up. So it is good. We got those wins and we fought hard and, you know, the jazz are still well coached and they've got great defense and their system's great, but we should have won those games. You know, we're better than those teams. There, there was one one play in particular against the Warriors that that uh, just made me kind of smile a little bit because you know I that my big my biggest thing to this week is talking about confidence and gaining confidence. But when you when you get to see Carl Anthony Towns kind of dunk on Wiggins and say, "Hey, you know, we, we ain't joking around," you know, like yeah. <laughs> that's a big play for a young team that needs to gain confidence. So that was kind of fun to see him say, hey, you know what, screw you, dude. <laughs> and he took it angry. Like he didn't yeah. have to drive it that hard. Like he, usually he doesn't. And and he took that, um, that pick and roll and just dove hard at the hole. Like it was a, yeah, it was a different, he did it with intention. So that was good to see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And just a very exciting week to be a Minnesota Timberwolves fan uh, going forward. But, Chris, I know something that you wanted to talk about 
was kind of the Malik Beasley situation. Uh, Malik Beasley hasn't played uh, for a bunch of games, and um, obviously this offseason, because of an injury, obviously this offseason he will um, have to do the workhouse thing or whatever. I don't know, go to jail at night or whatever. Um, so, so let's, let's talk about this. Um, where do you think Malik Beasley fits in this team? And also, do you think that he could be a trade piece this off season, or do you think he's a part of the long-term plan with the Wolves? And we'll start with you, Chris. What do you think? I think a lot of it's going to come down to ping pong balls. Um, cause I think if we get the pick, which, you know, even if we were the number one or the, the worst team in the NBA, we still had a 60% chance of losing the pick. So um, even if we do get the pick, which will be odds against us, that guy brings it, that rookie's going to bring in a $10 million salary, and we can't afford that. Um, so we would have to move Ricky and some pieces to even just make room for that $10 million salary. And I think at this point, I'm starting to think that I don't know if we're going to be able to move Ricky. Um, I don't know if I don't know if he has enough. Va- he might have enough value on the right moment to someone for take on a 17 million for one year expiring. But I think we'd have to add so much to it, and I don't know. It'll be tricky. I think Ricky or Beasley is gone if we get that first pick. I think it's almost guaranteed. Um, if we lose that first pick. I think then maybe Beasley stays, but um, it's going to be very interesting because I'm not sure. I'm not sure what his role is. I I think he's on one of the best contracts in the NBA. I'll say that right now. And I know some people disagree with that, but as just a flamethrower before he got hurt, he was average like in the month before he got hurt, he was averaging like 25 a game. He had multiple 30 point games, multiple 25 point point games, you know, shooting great percentages. Um, He's a very good basketball player. It's just how many more points are we looking to score? Like that's not, when we're watching the Golden State game, they said, they said something that was kind of interesting where they have pretty much Clay um, and they have Curry and like maybe one other piece that's like their offensive guys. And then everybody else on that team is defense because those guys can carry enough offense. I think D'Lo, B, I think D'Lo, Edwards, and Cat will be able to carry our offense enough with guys like Jaden pick, pitching in what he does, and you know here and there guys pitching in you know five to ten points. But I almost don't know if we can ha- afford fourteen million on another guy that's almost all offense. I just don't know if we can. Um, and that's not even to get in the fact that I don't even know what's going on with him. Like this hamstring to be out this long is a little suspect um, to happen right when like his new girlfriend, uh, Scotty Pippen's ex-wife, like kicks him out again, like kicks him out or breaks up with him. And like he's it's just been really ugly in his personal life right when this hamstring happened. Like, I don't know, man. Court st- it's just, I, I don't know if it was, it was like, hey, man, you got to get your life together. Or maybe it is really a hamstring. I don't know. I, bl- I tore my hamstrings once and it took forever to heal. So I don't know. It's mm-hmm. just he's going to be the wild card this offseason in my mind. I don't know. And, and I think it's going to depend on what happens in the draft. But there's going to be a lot of moving pieces, I think, around him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it did. I did see this that Malik Beasley has resumed on court activity. So that's good. So, um, so yeah, maybe maybe he comes back and maybe. But I I think it is encouraging, kind of like what you were saying, uh, that we have been winning games even without him. So it's not like um, we we've been. And a lot of that has been people stepping up off the bench, particularly D'Lo off the bench, Wancho off the bench. Nas. Yeah, Nas, absolutely off the bench. So, I mean, we have one of the best scoring benches in the league. But, Jared, anything to add on that? Your thoughts on Malik? You know, it it gets kind of tough, like like Chris was saying, because, um, you know, I've been a big Malik Beasley supporter. I think, like you said, he's on a really good contract. 
I was thinking about this the other day. I think he could also be added as a trade piece if we're going big game hunting still. We don't know if we even have to do that still. We like our I'll tell you what, Gerson, Gerson Rosas' phone is gonna have a lot of phone calls this offseason. And and they're gonna be about the pick if we get it. They're gonna be about Beasley. They're gonna be a few about Rubio. Like his, he's gonna have a busy, busy phone, and, and people are gonna know his phone number um, come trade talk times. Because we're probably looking to to move at least a couple of these guys, if not two, two of them together, and a pick for a big game hunt type deal. But it it gets really confusing because if something like that doesn't work out, does Ricky Rubio come back here on a? on a on a favorable deal compared to the one he's on i mean maybe he does maybe he wants to sit around here and, and be the leader to this young team for two more years you know i don't know that that's a conversation you'd have to have with ricky rubio but at the same point in time i mean beasley could also be that guy flamethrower off the bench i mean we, we're we, we got talent everywhere it's just it's just really gelling them together and putting them in the right spots um but like, I don't think there's a need for us to start uh, D'Lo, Beasley, Ant, and Cat all together. Like, my no. one of them guys is going to have to move to the bench, you know. Like, and, and maybe Beasley becomes the flamethrower off the bench. I know we've all liked seeing D'Lo come off the bench, but I can promise you next season that D'Lo is going to be our starting point guard because no max player comes off the bench. Um, it, it gets tough. Look, don't get me wrong. It, it gets very tough. Um, and I think Rosas has thought about this and he's going to have to answer some of these questions come probably draft day, draft day trade type deal. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Driss. I hope that D'Lo coming off the bench and doing it so honorably. Um, so, I mean, who knows what's happening in the locker room, but I'm assuming he's not making a stink about it. Um, in my perfect off season, it's Rubio that gets moved, even though I love him. And I think he's valuable in a lot of ways other than box score. Um, and I hope that the starting lineup, let's say we don't get the pick and we don't have free agent money. So let's ignore that idea. So I say the starting lineup is D'Lo, Edwards, McDaniels, and then I start Nas and Cat. I mean, Nas to me needs to play 25 minutes a game. Um, and if he doesn't, I think he needs to demand a trade. Like he's that good of a player right now. And I don't think we can keep holding him back. Uh, I think we need to start him next to Cat and take our lumps defensively, maybe on the perimeter. But the way that we're playing, the way that Cat can kind of move his feet out there, Nas can do the same thing, shuffle side to side. And Nas can protect the rim as good as Cat, if not better. Um, I think we need to put that lineup out there and say, no, you guys need to adjust to us. You know, like we're going big. And if you're going small, Nas is going to just truck you in the post and or cat. Like that's what we need to do. We don't have enough talent to not start Nas at power forward in my mind. So then I think hopefully, like I was saying, D'Lo has been so good off the bench, like as a, as a citizen, that maybe Beasley would be like, okay, I'm going to be that same great, you know, teammate that's going to come off the bench and now I'm going to have the restrictor plate taken off and I'm going to be just firing, which is what he wants anyways. If he was in the starting lineup, he's not going to be seeing many shots with those guys. So I think maybe D'Lo has to, or Beasley has to come off the bench and, um, you know, we hopefully we find maybe a little better point guard, backup point guard than uh, McDaniel or than J-Mac to kind of run to run with him. I think the biggest thing with Nas, like, I think for for a while it was his conditioning, and and I feel like that that can only last so long. And I think he's pretty well conditioned now. I think he could contain twenty five minutes a game. I honestly do, um, but I think that was his big knock um, when he wasn't playing was his conditioning. Um, almost reminds me, you know, this is going to be a complete bizarre comparison, but. You ever remember when Boban came in and everyone loved Boban? He played like once every ten games and he looked good. And 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 he uh, his thing I was still love Boban. I still do too, but he never plays, and it's a conditioning yes. thing. And not to say that Nas is in the same sense as that, but I also think he's up to his conditioning level, and I think that is something that is worth talking about. And I think that he can handle twenty five minutes a game, and if he can't, 
you know, maybe if it's 20, I mean, we still got Vanderbilt. We still got Wancho. Like, we still have depth pieces to where I would be okay. fine moving forward, moving forward with the roster that we have into the, into the next day season, you know, and I never thought I'd say that. But, like, we look – that complete right now. I would like to add a little bit of a veteran piece in the post um, at some point. Um, maybe, maybe it's just a young draft pick that plays the four. I don't know. But well, like I guess, like we were talking about. I mean, this team is ten to twelve deep, uh, and and there's going to be some phone calls on some of these guys. Hey, Chris, go ahead. Well, you got some. You're, yeah, you're talking about Nas. Um, conditioning so when he came in so again I've been a big Nas guy since he was in high school because I knew that we were going to be drafting high and I knew that we needed a big and I um, scouted that class really hard so I loved him in high school and he came in in the combine the rookie combine he was the fattest person like he his body fat was measurably a higher than anybody else's um, so he was out of shape and he said he lost 30 pounds this year from last year or at this point now. So 30 pounds is a lot, even if it's stretched out over six feet, 10, six feet, 11. So he's putting in the work and it's only going to be better next year because all summer long I saw him, you know, he, he stayed in town and the, he'd always have little Instagram pictures with him just dripping sweat. So he's a worker. Um, he'll get there. I'm not worried about that. But yeah, conditioning was huge for him. Huge mm -hmm. issue. Absolutely. And one thing I'll say on the back to the Malik Beasley uh, issue um, is, and the D'Angelo Russell with him coming off the bench. I will say that D'Angelo Russell does seem to thrive when he's like the main guy, like when he's the ball handler and he's the main option. Uh, to score. And also another thing I'll mention is Malik Beasley does seem motivated to get better on defense. Kind of to your point about, um, about like having a guy that um, is only offense. I mean, he said he wants to be defensive player of the year one day. So, yep. so I mean, he could definitely like progress this off season. And I mean, that's, that's all he's going to have is being in jail at night in basketball. <laughs> Um, next right. So, I, and, who knows how much he could progress? Yeah, Jared. And with Devo, like I, I noticed this early on in the year. A lot of time, like people were talking about how you know his handle looks kind of loose and and stuff early on in the season. Man, he looks so good right now. Like his handle is tight. He can pass. He can. I mean, I can't. I could talk about a whole podcast about how good D'Angelo Russell looks right now um, because I really think that. Whatever time off that he he needed to take for his loose body and his knee or, or whatever it was, you know, man, this dude is this dude's gonna be an all star next year. That's uh, a, you know, if I if I'm gonna talk the wolves into a five seed, I'm gonna tell you that D'Lo is gonna be an all star too. I'm just gonna keep going with bold predictions all year all year long until we start next year. Okay. I think the I think the very first podcast I said that D'Lo I think is going to win over a lot of Wolves fans and become the number their favorite fan their favorite player this year and I think he would have if he was healthy the whole year. Um, he's just got so much box office to him, you know, like he's got so much of that flair, so much of that big shot, so much of that swagger. Like he's uh, yeah, he's going to be. I mean, he'll at least be all-star contention. I mean, in the West, it's hard to mm – -hmm. who are you going to knock off? But I guess, you know, Murray, Murray will be out probably most of the year, so that takes one guy. Mm -hmm. For sure. For sure. And, man, it's just – if only they realigned the divisions and put us in the East. <laughs> yes. <laughs> much more of a fighting – and it makes so much more sense. Our division with the Wolves, Detroit, Indiana, Chicago – Milwaukee. That would be perfect. Right. And if you have to, like, if one guy goes, if one team goes some other place, you still got Cleveland, you know, fairly close to like, mm -hmm. yeah, we could definitely do something better. I feel like this is the time where, where Chris says the Timberwolves travel more miles than any other team in the NBA. And they have for years and years and years. And it's complete BS. <laughs> that was last, that was last year. <laughs> but yeah, it is. It's tough. 
Yeah. But I mean, that's a tough, I mean, to think of it, like Portland is on our, like we're flying out to literally the, the, the coast. Like that's crazy. And I mean, all those LA teams are all in the same area too, travel wise. And... Right. Right. For sure. Yeah. I got something that I want to talk about that's non wolves related because I want to hear hear your guys' thoughts because yeah, I know go ahead. Go ahead. Is it Denver Nuggets related? It's not Denver Nuggets related. It's actually <laughs> the other team that both of you guys kind of like, and that is the Los Angeles Lakers are now set up to play the Clippers in the first round and be uh, on the road for the whole road to the finals if it were to happen. Uh, does that change your mind about the Lakers at all? Um, no, my initial thought is no, but I mean, I don't think it helps the cause, but right. Yeah. yeah I mean, me. Oh, go, go ahead. Chris. Go ahead. Are we talking everybody healthy? Like imaginary, everybody healthy. Yeah. I think the Lakers are still going to be able to pound everybody. I, I don't think, I mean, yeah, I think they win. I mean, I think they can. I mean, Denver, if they had Murray, I would have picked Denver. Um, that's who I picked at the beginning of the year to win it. But um, them losing Murray and every other guard on their roster is not going to help them. Um, but you give me Drummond, you give me Davis, and you give me LeBron, um, I'll take those three in any fight you got. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would tend to agree with you. I do think, well, I, I don't know. It's going to depend. I think the last – eight or so games for Lakers are going to be pivotal. Maybe they can work themselves up because if they have to play the Clippers in the first round, I mean, that that's going to be tough for them. But um, it's going to be pivotal to see LeBron James, if he can be healthy, and Anthony Davis, if he can be healthy. Now, they, LeBron, particularly LeBron, has shown no signs of slowing down in his entire career, and that is something that, is as absolutely astonishing at his age to still be going at what he's doing. But yeah, I mean, I would still go Lakers as well. But Un you know, unfortunately, if you're rooting if you're rooting against uh, the Lakers, uh, the Clippers play in the same arena as them, and it'll be a home series for them. <laughs> exactly. That's what, was, that's what I was just gonna say. I'm like, it's not that bad of a of a away <laughs> game for the Lakers playing the Clippers. Um, but I mean, let's not forget like the Clippers aren't all that either. Like the Clippers are, they're, they're fine. But I mean, the Clippers aren't world beaters. Like nobody's saying Kawhi's the runaway MVP. Like they were trying to tout them, you know, in, in Toronto, like, um, you know, the Clippers are, they're fine, but they're the four seed, you know, like they're behind a battered nuggets team and the Suns and the jazz, like they're not, they're not striking fear in people like they used to. The, the the biggest reason why I bring it up is because every basketball fan in the country wants to see Lakers against the Nets in the finals. And I think it would be great for basketball, but I think the road is getting harder for the Clippers, um, or not for the Clippers, for the for the Lakers. Um, I just thought I was here, I heard that on the radio the other day that they're like the, the fifth seed now. And I was like, oh, that's kind of – they kind of fell without Braun and, and AD and – and they're like uh, Gabe said, these these next eight games or whatever they got left are going to be crucial because all three of them haven't played much. Uh, I know that LeBron came back, so they have they've been back for like two games as a core. But it'll be interesting to see how that core develops um, going into the playoffs. LeBron's yeah. legs got to feel good right now. <laughs> I mean, he's so fresh, like he's going to be. I mean. They got enough games to get humming as a team, and with a LeBron James with a month and a half rest or whatever he said. Oh God! And I don't buy. I don't buy that he was injured that whole time. Like, I think that he was injured enough, and he's like, okay, I'm out of MVP contention. There's no need for me to beat my body up. Let's uh, let's come at this thing with a summer break, and he's gonna be <laughs> he's gonna be a monster. Mm -hmm. And to, to your point about like. Yes, of course, the Lakers and Nets will be fun too, but I think a lot of the NBA world would like to see the Suns, like to be honest. like I think a lot of the NBA world would love to see the Suns come out of the Western Conference just for the story. I mean, it, they they haven't made the playoffs since 2010, and they have that rising core of 
um, De of uh, Devin Booker and DeAndre Ayton. So I think a lot of the NBA is in love with the Phoenix Suns, but yeah. Fans, fans yeah. are, but I don't think the actual shield NBA is. I think they want that money from that, from that West Coast Lakers, you know, that vibe. They're, they're looking to sell those tickets, but yeah, who knows? Yeah, yeah for sure. And uh, so should we get into my question of the week here? Absolutely. I'm always I'm always ready for it. Always ready. <laughs> all right. All right. So this this is kind of inspired by let's see, what night? What night did we play the Warriors? Was that Thursday night? Sure, let's go with it. All right, Thursday night. This is inspired by Thursday night game. And obviously, of course, we all know who was back in town. Andrew Wiggins uh was back in town, uh, put up 27 points, played pretty well. Uh so my question tonight is when a player that used to play for, let's say, the Timberwolves comes back to town, do you root for them or do you root more actively against them? Or does it depend on who the player is? Like, for example, like a Jimmy Butler or a, or a Derek Rose. or So basically, when, when an opposing player that used to be a Timberwolf comes to town, do you root for them? And let's start with you, Jaron. My, my initial thought uh, kind of brings me back to uh, the bandwagon fan question, and I, I still kind of have that, that, that same answer. Like, if you ain't on our team now, get the hell out of here. But um, it depends who it is. I mean, there's, there's former Wolves players that are more well-liked than, than others. Um, but one of the first things that I said this podcast was I loved watching Cat dunk on Wiggins. And, and, and same thing, like, if Jimmy Butler comes to town and we own him, I love every minute of that because I want all the smoke. But um, it depends who it is for me. Um, like, like when when Rubio came to town um, and he wasn't on the team when he was with the Jazz and, and the Suns, I think the perception was a little different. I think people were like, "Oh yeah, you know, pretty Ricky's back in town." You know, like like if he has a good game, he has a good game. Um, kind of depends who it is for me. Um, but my initial thought is. If it's Butler, I want to I want to destroy him, and if it's Wiggins, I want to destroy him. So, um, but I, I, again, it depends on who the player is for me. What about you, Chris? What's it for you? I would say the player, depending on who it is, is important, but also um, like how was the situation? Like how did he leave? Like was it he wanted out? Was it you know like that? That plays a lot of role into it with me, but. Um, like to talk about like the the ones that matter recently, like Wiggins. Um, you know, it's weird. Like Wiggins was here forever and he's, you know, scored a ton of points and was, you know, but I just don't even really like in the realm of the NBA, he just isn't even, I don't care about him at all. Like I don't, I have no cares for, and I never did. Like he was fine. Like, He's a nice, he seems okay. Like he seems like the worst guy to hang out with, to party with. Like he's super boring, I bet. Like he's all, he's like, I don't know. He's like oatmeal. Like it's, <laughs> it's fine. It'll fill you up. You know, if you're hungry, it'll, it'll serve the purpose, but you don't love it. You know, it's, you know, like he's just whatever. Um, so I can't get mad at oatmeal. Like I don't love it, but you know, Jimmy Butler on the other hand, like, you know, he's like that, I don't know, like Canadian bacon, pineapple pizza, where some people just hate it and some people <laughs> love it. You know, like mm -hmm. I hate him. I No, I don't hate – I do hate him. I hate him because I – not – I mean, obviously I don't hate him, but like right. as a player. um, Because I, I thought that I think that he's an act. I think that he's – I think that he's a, a well-thought-out um, – character that has been marketed very well as this i try harder than anybody i don't care about money i only care about winning except for every move he's made where he's moved to a young team that's not winning for the money so like other than every move he's made his words sound good he just doesn't go the same way so i against him but i would it against him almost when he was a timberwolf too so i mean yeah, my, mine's all player to player to answer your question. When Christian Leitner came back, I was fine. <laughs> I think my thing with, with Butler is he kind of put this uh, 
pe- this belief into people's minds, like like the Timberwolves are always going to suck. That's what you do in Minnesota is you lose, and nobody tries hard, and screw Minnesota. And I think that kind of rubbed me the wrong way just because, like, it might have been somewhat true. Like, we might have needed a kick in the pants, but, like, screw you for saying that, dude. <laughs> you know, I've been watching it for 20 years, man. No one – all the people that have followed this team, they don't need to hear that shit again. So that was kind of my, my uh, biggest beef with it and all. That- and the guys he was talking about that to were Wiggins and Cat. And when he was the same age as Wiggins and Cat at that moment, he was riding the bench for the Bulls. Like mm-hmm. he tries to act like he was this instant stud. No, you were you were very average for a while. Like you weren't even starting basketball games when you were their age. These dudes are putting up 40 point games in the NBA before you age wise were even sniffing a starting lineup. So like He's just a get off my grass old man kind of thing, and <laughs> whatever, dude. He's not for me. What about you, Gabe? What would you do? You cheer uh, for him or you root against him? So for me, I I actively root against Andrew Wiggins because I don't know. It's kind of so. Uh, there's you hate thing. oatmeal? <laughs> yes, I, yes, I do. Well, there's this thing. There, there's this thing in marketing or whatever called buyer's remorse, and yeah. when I. I don't know. When I see Wiggins put up um, like 27 points, I'm like, oh, did we make the right decision? Is this pick going to wind up? It's just, it's that little, it's that little thing. in the. And I, I know it's BS because I'd much rather have D'Angelo Russell. I have to tell myself that. But I just, I don't want to say I want him to fail, but like it wouldn't be terrible. <laughs> right? If, I mean, it's not like if Andrew Wiggins fails or doesn't have a good rest of his career. It's not like he and his family is not are not going to be financially sound for the next. Exactly for the next three generations. Right. Exactly. Um, especially because he came from decent decent upbringing money wise too. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing about that trade that people need to people need to realize is, let's say we give them the the number four pick. You know. Because the top three we keep, just to remind everybody. We give them the number four pick, which is the best they could do, which they have a super, like a 10% chance of getting. But let's say we do. If you go historically, the number four pick isn't a lock to be a stud. Mm. I mean, you've got average guys around. I mean, you've got some good guys, some bad guys. So, like, let's say, let's just give them James Wiseman. Let's do that. Just, like, that type of player. So if, would you say Wiggins and Wiseman, would you trade them straight up for D'Lo right now? Yeah. Absolutely not. Dude, D'Lo's a way better player, dude. And he's still, what, 24, 25? Like, this whole thing that we possibly lost this trade is so preposterous to me. Like, it's not even close. We've won it, even with as bad as we've done this year, we've won that hands down, in my opinion. I, I just – so to your point, I want to go through – um, this doesn't have who was in 2020. I can't remember who was picked for in 2020, but uh, history of the fourth pick in the NBA draft. And mind you, that's the best they can get. Two, 2014, 2019, DeAndre Hunter. 2018, Jaron Jackson Jr. 2017, Josh Jackson. 2016, Dragon Bender. 2015, Kristaps Porzingis. Uh, 2014, Aaron Gordon. 2013, Cody Zeller. 2012, Deion Waiters. 2011, Tristan Thompson. So, okay, so there, there's about two of those guys that if they got if they got Przingis or maybe Jaron Jackson, bless if both of them were healthy, which they never are, but let's say those two guys are healthy, that would be like Wiggins and one of those guys for D'Lo. I'd be like, that's a close. That's close. And that's mm-hmm. the best out of a 10-year span or whatever you ran. So, like, mm-hmm. you know, it's the whole one in the hand is worth two in the bush idea. Like, right. dude, totally. we got, we've got a near all-star level point guard to pair with a big. Like, that's the most essential basketball thing since basketball began. Mm-hmm. You know, like, a ball hander that can create for himself and set up a dominant big. You can do so many things. With that, you know. 2020 was Patrick Williams, who was like the most boring rookie all season. Exactly. Let's add him to that list, and I'm still happy. <laughs> and uh, I just wanted to make one more point on the uh, do I root for players who come back. Yes, Butler and Wiggins I do not. 
But there definitely are some players I root for. For example, Derrick Rose. Like, yeah. I hope – I hope like, <laughs> I sometimes root for Derrick Rose to win an MVP again. I know it's not going to happen. But if that happened, I'd be very happy. Like, I root for Derrick Rose. Tom Thibodeau, I got to be honest, I root for Thibodeau. Maybe you guys are different on that. But I think it's great what he's doing in, in New York. Guys like, I don't know, Jeff Teague. I got nothing against Jeff Teague. Guys like Taj Gibson, I hope he succeeds and stuff like that. But, yeah, it, it, like you said, my two are definitely Butler and Wiggins. So, yeah. So uh, let's take a look at the Wolves' upcoming schedule. They actually have uh, a little bit of a break here or have throughout the weekend um, and into next week. Uh, they So only two games probably until we talk again. Uh, we have the Grizzlies at home, then we have the Heat on the road, and then on Sunday we have Orlando, which could turn into a pretty big game <laughs> here when you're talking about picks. Um, so let, let's go with this. Uh, Chris, what are you looking for out of the Wolves this week? I'm looking for Jaden McDaniels to put the ball on the floor some more. I'm looking for Nas to play 20 minutes a game a couple times. And uh, – you know, I'm looking for – is Noel coming back? I thought that he was, like, almost back last week. What I want to see him back in the lineup. I thought he was back. They just weren't playing him. Could be. Could be. Because I, I thought I saw a report that he was back. So, so I mean, all I'm, all I'm doing right now is, you know, rooting for solid basketball. It's tough because, I mean, I, I, I don't want to win so many where we're – at like the seventh or eighth spot just because it gets really hard to move up. But I think we're at a point now where, um, you know, we're not going to fall that. We're not going to get that far. We're going to stay right around where we're at. So let's play competitive. Let's get the winning spirit in these young guys' hearts and uh, finish strong, um, you know, and and see what Mr. Rosas can do in the offseason. Mm-hmm. And uh, Jared, what are you looking for out of the Wolves? I'm looking for uh, uh, D'Lo and Cat to set a high pick and roll, and then uh, I'm looking for Cat to kind of slip down and just ram one right down the throat of Jim Lee Butler. That's what I'm looking for this week. I like yes. it. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Well, uh, I think we're going to put an exclamation point on there. A good week for the Minnesota Timberwolves. Hopefully another one is right around the corner. Chris, thanks so much for joining us. Every time. Awesome. And Jared, thanks so much for being here. As always, guys. Always a blast. And this has been another Everything's Coming Up Timberwolves podcast. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe on YouTube. And make sure to follow us on Spotify so you never miss an episode. And as always, go Wolves.